left part of me this morning. Well, there's some names in here that's hard to pronounce for me, so I'm going to try my best. <laughs> so. Anyway, the scripture reading of God's Word today is in Luke 11. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. For a demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. And some of them said, By Belzebub, the prince of demons, he has driven out demons. Others tested him and asked him for a sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Belzebub. Now, if I drive out demons by Belzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoil. He who is not with me is with me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. So thank you. I've got a little bit of housekeeping we need to get done today. I'm going to pass this around, but now pay attention to the sermon. Don't get focused on this. But I need you to check emails, phone numbers, birth dates, and make sure everything's okay so that I can get these copies out. Okay? So I'm going to start it right here. There's different sheets. One, the first one's a birthday list. The second one's an anniversary list. And then the third one's just information. But we tried to fax it. Not fax it. Email it. We tried to email it to Wanda, and obviously we don't have your right email. Because you didn't get it, right? Yeah, it came back. So let's start with prayer. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today and worship you. I thank you for being able to live in a country where we do have freedom, where we have a peaceful election, that there might be protests and things, but there was an exchange of power. And Lord, I pray for this presidency and... All the people that are coming to office, like Barry said, Lord, I just pray that thy will be done, thy kingdom come. I pray that we see people saved in this administration, and I pray that we see a turning of this nation back to you. And Lord, I know that that starts with us, your people. So Father, I pray today that we hear your words, we take them to heart, and we take them to action. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> so did any of you watch the, all the goings on Friday? Yeah? Did you um, see the prayers that were given? Um, Jack Graham given one, right? Did you catch what he... Frank, I'm sorry, thank you. Did you catch what uh, he read? Turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and let's see what he read. I don't know about if you think the way I think, but at that point in time, the gospel was preached all the way around the world. Because with social media and everybody that's watching this and all the Twitters and the posts and the Facebook, whether they're for or against Christianity, whether they despise Jesus or love Him with all of their heart, they heard the gospel message. Awesome. What, what happened right there was, was stronger, in my opinion, than any days when Billy Graham preached. Because that message was God's Word and His Word does not come back void. And the passage that He chose was so much... The passage of salvation. He, he spoke from 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. 
He said, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. And trust to reliable men who, also, who will also be qualified to teach each, teach each other. Endure hardships like a <clears throat> good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving a soldier gets involved in civ civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone comp competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Well, I'm on the wrong thing. <laughs> Sorry, I just realized it. Why didn't anybody say anything before that? I'm, I've me I want to be in first... Timothy. That's why I put it in front of me instead of turning to it. Okay. That, that was good, though. We see who the commander is and we should run. Okay. So there was a good reason for that. It says, I urge you then in 1 Timothy chapter 2, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peacefully peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Wow. For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. That message was heard around the world and still will be talked about this week as people are still going on and saying, I'm going to protest or I'm for or whatever. They still heard those words that Paul wrote. I'm just so thankful that and I pray in your prayers that you pray for this administration and you pray for a revival not only in this country but in the world and the ushering back of Jesus to, to come back and take us home. So I just want to mention that. But today we're going to look at Luke a little bit more. Okay, we looked the last few weeks and we looked in Luke 8, Luke 9, and Luke 10. And I'll give you a little bit of background about Luke. He was a companion disciple that traveled with Paul. He learned about true discipleship, true Christian living. He wrote more than any other author of the New Testament. Even though he only had two books, there are more words that he wrote and penned than Paul or Peter or anyone else, John or whoever. Um... He knew what it meant to repent and to believe. You have to make a choice whether you're going to believe and then a choice of whether you're going to follow or not, if you're going to do something with that gracious gift that is given to you. This is understood by a disciple of Jesus Christ, and we saw this in the last few messages. From the moment that they met Jesus and He said, Come and follow after Me, they knew exactly what He was saying. And sometimes we kind of forget that today in this world, that we don't think we need to come and follow after Jesus. But that is what He expects. Last week we looked at the fact that there are no excuses, not even legitimate excuses, that Jesus expects you to come fully and follow after Him and make Him Lord of your life. The disciples that went after Jesus knew this. He was their teacher, their master, and their Lord. And they knew that the kingdom of God was at hand, so they had to learn how to live as those people, to live as Christians or little Christ, to live as dearly beloved children of the kingdom of God. In Luke 18, verse 16 and 17, Luke records, But Jesus called the children to Him and said, Let the little children come to Me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And you've heard me use an analogy before of a little child, because that's what Jesus is using, where I take my granddaughter and hold her in my arms, throw her up in my arms, take and swing her. She has every bit of confidence in me that I'm not going to drop her, that I'm going to protect her, that I'm going to look after her, that I'm going to love her. And Jesus says that we need to come in faith like that. So Luke writes an orderly account, not a chronological account, but an orderly account, so that the followers of Christ can understand not only who Jesus is, but what their role in the kingdom of God is. So in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 1, we read, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled. So there's no real need for another account. There's plenty of them out there. Verse 2 says, Just as they were handed down to us, by those who were first eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord. But with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated, 
which means that he has perfect understanding because he's gone out and searched for the truth and decided without a doubt that he knows the facts of Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God, that the resurrection happened, what our roles in Christianity and Christian living are. <clears throat> and he did this from the very beginning. I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theopolis. We're not sure who that is, but what I want to point out here is that it was someone that Luke cared about enough to train him up as a disciple, which goes right back to the Great Commission again, that we're supposed to teach the gospel and then train up disciples. And so many times we forget about that training up of disciples, and then we wonder why they depart away. Verse 4 says, So that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught, or the King James says instructed. Because we received instructions from Jesus. Every disciple knows that. That's why they followed after their teacher. That's why they said, teacher, teacher, or rabbi, rabbi, what must I do? They wanted to know what Jesus' teachings were so that they could follow them. Not so they could let them go in one ear and out the other. Been there, done that, right? Probably still will again. So Luke's gospel was written after Matthew and Mark. He had that time out on the road. He saw churches with Paul being established. He knew there was a need for this so that people would know what their responsibility was in the kingdom of heaven. And if you notice, I've mentioned kingdom of heaven several times already. In Luke and Acts, which Acts is his continuation of, of, of the book of Luke's to Theopolis again, he records kingdom of God over 50 times. I think it's something we need to take into consideration, right? Fifty times he mentions kingdom of God. So I said a minute ago that Acts was a continuation. Let's look at the beginning of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, it says, In my former book, Theopolis, so we're still we're a continuation of that writing to Theopolis for further instructions, I wrote about all the things that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions, so Jesus continued to give instructions to his followers, to his disciples, to those who chose to believe, up to the day that he departed to heaven, through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And when we learn from Paul, we learn that we are all called to be apostles. There are 12 apostles, as I say, with a capital A, but we are all apostles because we're all set apart to teach and preach the gospel message. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over 40 days and spoke about, imagine that, the kingdom of God, right? We've got a pattern going here. So Jesus was everything that he claimed to be. He fulfilled God's mission on earth. He came to seek and save those who were lost. But we have to decide if we're going to be his disciple or not. Whether we're going to come after him and follow after him, make him Lord of our lives or not. Acts, I've said before, if you remember that the title, in my opinion, my opinion again, I'll clarify that, should not be Acts of the Apostles, which is not, the title is Acts, but it should be Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Because we see men and women who were cowards in Luke, who turned away and ran from confrontation, who denied Jesus Christ, become bold men and women of God. And what happened? We read over and over again, if you start reading the first few chapters, that more and more were added to their numbers. The church grew. Was it because persecution wasn't there? No. It was because the power of the Holy Spirit was there in the individual. So we need to learn what it's like to live a life through the Holy Spirit. If you're coming to our Romans Bible study, guess what? It's coincidental, isn't it? That that's right where we're getting tonight. We're at Romans 5 verse 12, which is starting the sanctification process so that we can read about and learn what it's like to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live holy lives that we were set apart to do. <clears throat> the ending of Acts kind of ends abruptly. It's like, what happened? We don't even know what, what, hap what happens there. It just kind of stops. Is it because something happened, or is it because Luke left room for us to write our own stories? Because it's a continuation of every apostle's story up until the time when we die or until the time when Jesus Christ comes. We are supposed to write His story, to let God's will be done rather than our will be done. And if you remember in Acts 11, the, Christ, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Acts 11:26 in the second part of the verse says, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. It's pretty clear. 
We are disciples that 11 chapters later into Christian living in Acts, we see them truly living by the power of the Holy Spirit. So they were called Christians. If you remember, Barnabas went to get Paul because he was so excited about what was going on at the church there in Antioch. And there was a new name given to the followers of Christ. It was Christians, little Christ or like Christ. Because people were truly living by the power of the Holy Spirit and the church was growing. I don't know about you, but I would love to see that for our nation and for our world. So we've got to get back to the basics. So I didn't have a clue what I was going to preach on this week. The last three weeks were kind of fell right into pattern, but this week I was like, what am I going to teach on? But then when God reveals it to you, He's pretty clear because it goes perfect with the election and everything else. And when I was looking, I looked all through Luke since I'd been looking, preaching out of Luke. I went all through and I said, I've preached on that. No, no, And I went all through and did nothing. And then later in the week, I'm like, look at the very next chapter, dummy. <laughs> Luke chapter 11, which goes right into where we need to be. And God was telling me that we should talk about these scriptures for our church, for the time that the world's in and everything else. Because we need to learn more about Christian discipleship. For three weeks, I've said, do you want to follow after Jesus? Will you let Him prepare the soil of your heart? Will you quit having distractions? Will you not make excuses? So now we're moving into, in chapter 11, the power of the Holy Spirit to live Christian lives, to learn what discipleship really means. So I'm going to call this teaching a teaching about discipleship or Christian living. I'm going to look back in, a little further in Luke first before we get to chapter 11. What was the first miracle recorded by Luke? Because again, we're looking at the work of Luke. We're looking at the audience that he's writing it to, what his purpose is in writing. Like John's first miracle was the water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana. Okay? Why was that important? Because John was writing so that we may believe. So he started his gospel off with a celebration that the Messiah has come and we're celebrating. And Jesus turns water. He changes the physical properties of water. He has power over nature to change it into wine because we are celebrating the marriage of the Lamb to, uh, to the church, to the believers. Well, Luke has a little different purpose, and he starts out with a demon exercising. He casts out a demon. In Luke chapter 4, verse 31, so he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Now, I don't know if you noticed, but it said at first there's a demon, now it says us. Has Jesus come to rob the power of Satan from this world? That's what I read out of the scripture there. I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them and came out without injuring him. He could have totally harmed the person, but did not because he was totally obedient to Jesus because Jesus has authority. All authority in heaven and earth was given to Jesus. And even the demons obey him. So why do we hesitate to obey him sometimes, right? <clears throat> Verse 36, All the people were amazed and said to each other, What words these are? With authority and power he gives orders to impure spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread through the surrounding area. So why do you think Luke recorded that message first? He's, or that miracle first? He's setting up the tone for his gospel that Jesus came to destroy the authority of the devil. To set us free. The devil does not have power over believers because we have the power of God living inside of us. We are sealed with the power of the Holy Spirit. He resides in us and Satan has no power and authority over us. Why did God send His Son to seek and save out, to, to seek and save the lost? Those who are spiritually lost. He, Jesus did physical miracles, but the th thought behind this, the importance behind this, is the spiritual. He did come to bring people back to life literally from the dead. We, he did those miracles, but He came to save us so that we would have eternal life and escape the eternal punishment of a holy and just God. 
He came to destroy the power of Satan. We fight a spiritual battle. We have to remember that so that we can walk by faith, not by sight. Luke wrote more about casting demons out than any other gospel writer. Go figure. It makes sense now, doesn't it? <clears throat> in Luke chapter 9, we see a breaking point, though. In verse 51 Luke, of Luke 9, Jesus, Luke records that Jesus is on His final days to do what He came to do to go to Jerusalem to die for our sins. So the miracles and the stories we see in the first eight chapters, in the beginning of nine, are telling who God is. But starting in verse nine, we understood who God is, and that's why Jesus says, are you going to follow me or not? If you're going to follow me, it costs giving up your home. It may cost giving up your family. It means that you're coming after me, no excuses, no debates. You're going to be my follower and follow me. And if you remember in Luke chapter 10, the 70 that went out came back with joy. And they said, even demons submitted under... And see the demon pattern in here? And he said, don't worry about that. That's not what's important. What's important is that your name is written in heaven. So the demon miracles were all of a significant showing us as Christians that they have no power over us. That Jesus came, He died for our sins, and He set us free. Death has no sting. We have victory in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> so we've looked at Luke 9. We've looked at Luke 10. So let's look at Luke 11 today and see what we can come up with. And I'll read the passage to you again. This has some counter passages that Matthew and Mark looked at, so I'm going to look at them right behind it so we can get some more background to what what the story is going on here. In Luke eleven fourteen, 14, Jesus was driving out a de demon that was mute. While the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he drives out demons. Others tested him and asked for a sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts. And remember, we talked about that last week with the answers that he gave to the ones that gave the excuses. And he said, as a result, any kingdom... Hot, we've got kingdom again. Divided against itself will be ruined. Because we have a kingdom of God here, and we have the kingdom of the ruler of this earth, the prince of evil, the devil. We fight a spiritual battle. You will serve one of the two masters, and by not serving one master, you are serving the other master. There's no neutrality here. Any kingdom divided among, against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself... How can his kingdom sta stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebul. Now if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor which the man trusted, and divides his, spl his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And you notice the title that I had was whether we're gatherers or scatterers. And I'm not going to get to that today. I'm going to let that reside with you for you to think about when you leave here. Do you gather or do you scatter for Jesus? It's something that we need to consider. That account can also be found in Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 22. Then they brought him. So we see a little difference there. We see that someone brought this man to Jesus. A demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. Well, wait a minute. We learned he was mute in Luke, right? This says blind and mute. Do we have a contradiction in scriptures here? Or do we have more information? More information is not a contradiction. We have more information. There's nothing contradicting about scriptures here. This also could not be the same account necessarily, but the more that we look at it, there's a lot of coincidences. I say it is the same account. So I say simply that you have two different people here giving their accounts, and one didn't have anything to say about the blindness because he's not worried about the miracle. If you listen to what was read earlier, the miracle was just the setting, showing again that Jesus can drive out demons. Now the conversation that Jesus has is what we need to apply. So Luke didn't find it important to mention that the man was blind or maybe that he had one leg, right? We don't know that because no one says that, but he could have had one leg. But Luke was simply saying that 
a man, we didn't even know he was brought, that had a demon in him, that made him mute, that Jesus is going to cast out. So it's the setting. Still in Matthew 12, 22, And Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. Because Jesus cures all ailments. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? So Matthew's point probably, which we're not focused on today, is a little different. It's probably on who Jesus is. But Luke's point is on Christian living. It's what Jesus can do by the power of the Spirit. That He can have you live a life where these demons have no control over you anymore. Where Satan doesn't have dominion. Where a stronger man's going to come in and reign over your household if you'll let him. <clears throat> Verse 24, but, because we have a contradiction here, the people were saying, could this be? They're wanting to learn, but here comes Satan in to distract, to deceive, to destroy. The Pharisees, the very ones who should know better, heard this and said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Now, I don't know if yours says Beelzebub or Beelzebul, but that goes back to the Old Testament. Beelzebub was the lord of the flies. And Beelzebul is the Greek name for that, and it has progressed through time and got even worse and despicable. Because not only is Satan the lord of flies, but he's the lord of flies that gathers around the dung. And that's what these Pharisees were saying about Jesus. You're the flies that swarm around crap. I mean, they were insulting him. Because of the content, con, not content, what's the word? The hardness they had in their hearts for Jesus. It's not contempt, what's the word? Contempt. contempt. I'm close, I'm off a letter or whatever, thank you. <laughs> so I grasped at it, it was, it was eating at me. Jesus knew their thoughts. Same thing here again. You can't hide your thoughts from Jesus. He knows your heart. That's why John says in uh, John 4 that, that the Father searches out those whose hearts are set on Him for true worship. Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. Every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, so we can know here that Beelzebul is Satan, if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? If I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? He's painting them in a corner here if you had not figured this out yet. If your guys can do it and you say that they're by God, then why in the world are you getting your information saying I'm from the devil and my power is from the devil? Okay, we'll see this in a minute. But if by the Spirit of God where Luke said the finger of God, and there's some importance there. But we see it's the Spirit of God here, the same Spirit that resides in each and every Christian, the Spirit that we're born again by. So the same miracle that Jesus, the same power and authority He has, you have in your life as a child of God, the Spirit of God living inside of you. If by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can you enter a strong man's house and carry off his plunder unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder the house. And when you plunder the house, you take what's precious, right? You take what you want. And we'll get to that in a little bit. And he closes the passage in Matthew exact same words. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Okay, here's the account from Mark. It's in chapter 3, starting in verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house. And again, a crowd gathered. So we've got a crowd here. So the ones that brought him in Matthew 12 were a crowd. And we see that all throughout Scripture because there's tons of people wanting a Savior that's going to fill their needs. And again, the analogy I use is putting a quarter in the vending machine and choosing the selection that I want. That's nice to have that kind of God, isn't it? But how would that ever be a God, a deity, all-powerful, can create everything, and he's at your button request when you put a dime in. So anyway, <clears throat> the crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not able to eat. And this sounds similar to the Samaritan woman in, Luke, in John 4, where the disciples went to go to town to get something to eat, where Jesus stayed behind to do his mission work, to tell a woman that the disciples passed by and probably looked at with contempt, a scornful woman, a, a woman that does things that we, we're not proud of, that we want to poke fingers of. And Jesus wanted to 
tell her that the kingdom of God had come, that the Messiah was here. So we have a similar thing. They were not able to eat. So when his family heard about this, they, took, they went to take charge of him, take control of him, subdue him. For they said, he is out of his mind. He's nuts. He's cuckoo. It's time to eat. I'm hungry. I'm famished. And he's more worried about healing a demon-possessed man. Well, I'd be more worried about that. It only seems logical. But they're like, he's out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem, we got the but here, says he is possessed by Beelzebul. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to him in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. Let me read that again because that's cool. His end has come. He's talking about the devil, his authority, his power, because Jesus Christ came and took it from him, right? <clears throat> but whoever blasphemes... Oh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, I skipped the verse. Verse 27, In fact, no one who enters a strong man's house without first tying him up, then he can plunder the strong man's house. Now we go a little different from the story, but that other was pretty familiar except the house part. So we're getting some different parts of the story in because they're told from different people. Verse 28, Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven of their sins of every slander they utter, including the Pharisees who just slandered him terribly by saying he was the Lord of the flies of dung, right? But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of eternal sin. Now, I'll save that message for another day. Don't get off on that because I could stay here all day. Verse 30, he said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mothers and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. And I've given you this in the last few sermons. I don't remember which one it was in. Verse 33, Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. So Jesus has a point here to say. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Mark closes out this passage with, Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Compared to whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. We can put those together easily enough, right? You're either for Jesus or you're against Jesus. You're part of His family, born again. You belong to the family of God, the kingdom of God, or you're not. Jesus keeps it black and white. <clears throat> so let's go through Luke verse by verse. In verse 14, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. The miracle, like I said here, is not Luke's focus. The miracle is simply the setting, and it's a miracle that Luke uses over and over to reinforce to us when we're reading this that Satan has no power over us. Okay? We saw that there was a large crowd um, from Matthew. And in uh, Matthew chapter 12, if we go back a few verses to verse 15 and 16, we started at verse 22 before. Matthew records, Jesus withdrew from that place and a large crowd followed Him. So we learn it's not even just a crowd, but a large crowd. And He healed all who were ill. He warned them not to tell others about Him. So see, Matthew has a totally different focus. He's still in the phase in his writings of telling people, could this be the Messiah? That's why we, we see that in verse 23, the response of the people is, could this be the son of David? He's still building up the case for who Jesus is. But Luke is already the point. We've made the case. Jesus is on his final days, final teaching, resently, resolutely setting out for Jerusalem. And the Samaritans got upset with that. We're back in Luke 9 now. Um, yeah, verse 51, starting there. And they got upset because Jesus wasn't going to stay in their land and perform any more miracles. Let them put a quarter in the vending machine. So they got upset. They weren't ready 
to follow after Him, to be a true disciple. They still were in the phase where we want to be fed, we want to be healed. If you read in John, that comes in John verse 6, 6, 6, right? Where so many people left Him after the feeding of the 5,000 and everything. And He told them, you simply want the food that I can give you, the things I give you. You don't want a Savior and a Lord. You don't want to worship God. <clears throat> so we've got Luke 14 under. Luke 15. <clears throat> But some of them said, so now we're presented with a dilemma, right? We're past the miracle. The miracle's not what Luke is focusing on. Some of them said, by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. So we've got two different problem makers here, right? So what about verse 16? Verse 16 says, others tested by asking him for a sign for heaven. Did we read anything about the others this morning? Do you remember anything about them? Probably not, because if you jump down to Luke 29, it says, As the crowds increased, Jesus said, This is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign. But none will be given except for the sign of Jonah. So Jesus is not answering the people in verse 16 here. He's only answering the people in verse 15 here. The Pharisees that we learn from our other scripture, the religious authorities that said, By Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. This direct assault to Jesus and who he was. And not only that you're not who you say you are, but you're the exact opposite. You're a son of the devil rather than the son of God. So this is who Jesus is, is addressing. Verse 17, Jesus knew their thoughts. We've been over that and over that because that's what Jesus does. He examines our hearts, He examines our thoughts, and He gets to the issue or, or not. Will you follow after me or not? That's the first thing He says when He encounters is, Dute opiso mu, come and follow me. And then He continues with, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? So that's an and. We've got the kingdom divided will fall. If Satan is divided, then his kingdom will fall. Correct? How can it stand? It will fall. <clears throat> I say this because you claim, he's getting right back to their statement, you're the ones claiming that I drive out demons by Beelzebul. That's a preposterous idea, and I'm going to back you into a corner as Jesus does. He, he hits the issue directly, no holds barred, and He paints them into a corner where there's nothing they can do. And that's why their contempt and anger got so great for Him that it led Him to the cross where we nailed Him to the tree. Because He was despised. We didn't want a God. We wanted a Savior that would give us what we wanted. I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebul. Verse 19. There's kind of a hidden but here. If I do drive out demons by Beelzebul, then by whom do your followers drive them out? Because there were people doing the same thing. And how can you say that your guys, who claim to be prophets of God, to know scriptures, to abide by the law, how can they be doing this and I'm not? I've gave many more convincing proofs. You don't like for the fact that I say that I am the Son of God. <clears throat> so they will be your judges. He just painted them into that corner. <laughs> There's nothing they can do now but sit back and take it, right? But what they do with it is what they do with it. We saw some Pharisees, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night, but later came to Jesus in broad daylight and took his body to a grave. He wasn't worried about what people thought about him anymore, what things could happen to him. He said, I understand the cost, and I'm willing. So just because you're a Pharisee doesn't mean that you can't come to Jesus. All can come to Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but all, it is God's will that all be saved, and that it is God's will that men be sanctified, that they live that holy, set-apart life. And that's what Luke is teaching here. In verse 20, But... Jesus has debated them, painted them in a corner where they can't win. If I drive out demons by the finger of God... Now, why does he use finger of God here? Because it's a reference back to the Old Testament. 
So that's, he hit them exactly with what they knew. They understand all the Old Testament law. They twist it and use it for their own needs, but they know the law. So he referenced <clears throat> Exodus 31, 18, where you read, When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, He gave him two tablets. We know what those are, right? Of the covenant law, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. So they hit him with that he was the Lord of flies of dung. He hit him back with, if God by his own finger gave Moses, who gave you the law, which you rely on for your salvation, if he got those tablets by the finger of God, then I perform this exorcism by the finger of God. See, when you study that scripture, see how significant those words are into it? It is a proved fact is what he's saying. If I can do this miracle that I'm who I say I am, it's by the finger and power of God. The kingdom of God has come upon you then. Everything that I'm saying, everything that Luke is recording is true. The kingdom of God is here. Remember I said Luke says it over 50 times. And if the kingdom of God has come, if it's come on earth now, then you've got to make the decision. Are you going to repent and change your ways? Are you going to follow after Jesus? Or are you going to keep on going with the same thinking that we talked about before in distractions, which makes you mentally insane? Because that's what the distractions do from the devil. They drive you out of clear thinking, drive you out of the process of turning to the truth, turning to God. So by the finger of God, Jesus was doing this. Verse 21, but Jesus isn't done with his teachings yet. So he gives another parable. When a strong man fully armed guards his house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks, overpowers him, and takes the arm in which the man trusted, and divides up his plunder. Now what does that mean? That's kind of confusing, isn't it? Take it in the context of what Jesus is saying. Who's the strong man? The devil, because you think he's got a hold on you. That's why you say, the devil made me do it. He's got power and dominion over you. No, he doesn't. The devil can't make you do anything. You want to blame the devil for your sins. It's your choice that you do these things. It's your choice whether you follow or you don't follow. So the strong man is the devil who has ownership of his house. You, you fight a spiritual battle. He has possessions of it and his possessions are safe. Until someone comes stronger, someone who comes with the power of God, who under the finger of God casts out demons, who heals the sick, who heals the blind, the mute, the lame, and says, I can heal you of everything, including eternal damnation. I have the keys to heaven and I'm giving them to you if you will simply believe. I mean, what a strong passage this is. When someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor, the power in which the man trusts, and he divides his plunder. The difference here is we've got to decide where we stand, which master we serve. Then Mark ended his account with whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. And Matthew and Luke end the account with whoever is not with me is against me. We don't like to think about it that way, but when we're neutral... We're not neutral. We're standing for someone. And we're not standing for Jesus because He's told us exactly what to do. So when our brother offends us, and we know what Scripture says, and we say, well, I'm just going to go to bed tonight and not worry about that. I have every right to. Then you're serving a different master than Jesus. And all you've got to do is realize that, give it to Him, and He'll take it from you. And He can take it once and for all if you'll let Him. And it does take a daily taking up our cross, denying ourselves and following after Jesus. It's not something you can just do. It's a discipleship walk. That's why it took 11 chapters throughout seeing the church growth and everything to see that the Christians were first, or the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. It's a process. You've got to do it daily if you're willing. If you're not 100% totally with Jesus, then Jesus says you're against Him. If you remember words from Revelation chapter 3, one of the seven letters to the churches, Jesus, or John records Jesus' words in verse 15 and 16. He says, I know your deeds, just like we read here, I know your heart, I know your thoughts. That you are neither cold nor hot. 
You're not with him or against him. You're neutral. I wish you were one or the other. Verse 16, so because you are lukewarm, you're not for me or against me, neither hot, neither cold, I'm about to spit you, vomit you out of my mouth. What a terrible, terrible thought. But he goes on to record just a few la verses later, John does in verse 19, those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. We do that with our own children. Maybe God's doing that in your life now. Maybe you're not to that point yet. You can repent before you have to be disciplined, right? We, we, as parents, we long to see that before we have to do discipline. We don't want to do discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. On your heart, Jesus says, will you follow after me? If you're not for me, you're against me. If anyone hears my voice, those who have ears, let them hear, right? We talked about that. And I think you're going to hear that in just a second again. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. The one who is victorious, who has power over the devil, who has eternal salvation, I will give to the right to sit with, my, with me on my throne just as I was victorious over the devil, that strong man that I came in and defeated, and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Told you we'd hear it again. What the Spirit says to the churches. So Luke eleven twenty three 23 said, Whoever does not gather with me scatters. And I told you I wasn't going to go further than that. That's a decision for you to make with God, with Jesus. Are you going to be His brother? Are you going to be for Him? Are you going to see the importance of your life, your responsibility, your role as a Christian, what Christian living means? Keep on reading in Luke, and we're going to. Back a couple months ago, I was in Luke chapter 12 and said I wasn't going on any further because the timing wasn't right. Looks like that might be coming around soon because that's just a chapter away where Jesus talks about that He's left us in charge, that He's gone away, and when he comes back, he's expecting his servants to be anticipating and waiting for him, and he expects them to be doing. And he even goes on to say that he cuts his servants in half, so we'll get into that later. But are you scattering? Are you gathering? What does that mean in your life? Where can that be applied? I pray that you take that with you and you ask Jesus, where do you want me to work? What are you wanting me to do? Show me the opportunities. Because there might be somebody that's just been sitting right in front of your eyes the whole time, just like the next chapter was right in front of my eyes when I had no clue where I was going to preach. That Jesus is saying, you need to witness to this person. You need to make this relationship right. They're looking for you as my disciple. They've been watching you. Maybe it's your child. Maybe it's a sibling, whoever it is. Maybe you're perfect and you need to see to praise God for all of His goodness and the victory in your life. Whatever it is, the question is, do you gather or do you scatter? Father, I thank you so much for the confidence and power that we have in Jesus Christ. To know that you loved us enough that you would sacrifice your only son. And that if you love us that much that you're always going to be for us. You're never going to be against us no matter what things affect us, Lord. So help us not to be deceived by the devil. Help us not to be distracted by the things that he's put in this world. But be obedient, loving servants that we do the Father's will, that we bring glory and honor to God our Father because of the love that He gave us through Jesus Christ. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Stand with me, please.